Good morning. I do have a few announcements this morning. This sounds very loud. Am I like scarily loud? No? Okay. So the Board of Trustees has voted to make mask wearing completely optional at this point. We are going to be continuing to watch the COVID case numbers, and if we need to adjust our policies, we will do so. And at this point, we know how to keep each, each other safe, and um, we know how to adjust quickly when we have to. We are taking orders for Easter flowers in honor or in memory of a loved one, and the order forms are in your order of service, this order form here. And we would like to have the orders in by this Thursday, April the 7th, and Christine, um, um, if you need to get in touch with her about that, you can put those um, forms under her door because she was going to put an envelope but didn't get to it yet. Um, so if you're watching from home and want to submit your order later, just slide the, the forms under her door. We are looking for some additional volunteers to help with our second annual socks and underwear drive. It's going to be even bigger and better this year. Please see Holly Tangway or Kate Rizeki to volunteer to help out. And the next book in our congregational reading series is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And the discussion is going to take place on April the 8th, next Friday. And for more information about the book, please check out the weekly email. And for our friends watching from home today, we have attached this morning's order of service to Friday's weekly email announcements. So please um, download that and follow along. You'll know exactly what's coming up. Also, before we get started at home, folks, if you'd like to light a ch chalice or a candle along with us, please go and get one now so that we can do this ritual together in spirit. And now, um, Jim Seavey has an announcement. So Jim, let's see if I can do this microphone. I think it's on. Give it a, give it a try. Well, uh, I, I became, thanks to, uh, thanks to Myrna, I became a member of the board here. And last fall we had a retreat and we decided that a high priority for this year would be to renew our mission statement, which is, I think, in the order of service. Um, and there, we have come up with a process for doing that, and we're going to do it quite intensively this year, and I need some help. And so the, 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 the announcement is in the uh, weekly newsletter this week and last week. And so um, be warned that if you don't come forward and see me and offer your help in developing a, a mission statement, I will, come, I will go fishing. to see you here this morning. 
Um, welcome to the Gloucester UU Church, which we like to say is a very old and historic church with a progressive message that we are all born out of one love, and to that love we will one day return. And so with that universal message and our universalist heritage, you know that you are welcome here. The, the, the love of the universe is wide enough to include you, whether you come here with no traditional beliefs or different beliefs, and whether you are here in person or you are joining us on YouTube this morning, you are welcome. As a welcoming congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association, we welcome the full inclusion of people of all sexual orientations and gender expressions. So just a couple of things before we get started. Um, one is that, oh, and if you, actually, I forgot to mention, if you want to get better acquainted with us, um, please fill out the pew card. You see the yellow card on the backs of the pews, and you can just drop it in the collection plate later as it comes by, and we'd be happy to be in touch with you. We also serve coffee out in the vestibule um, after the service, and we hope you'll stay and join us. Uh, let's see. So. Um, I've been wanting to mention every week that um, my sabbatical is approaching um, the beginning of May, and so if uh, I'm really encouraging folks to uh, come in and, and see me before I go, um, and now is a good time to try to set something up. Um, so I just wanted to kind of keep, uh, keep mentioning that. And then also uh, associated with that, um, now that we are really uh, back, um, getting back in full swing, um, we want to finally start being able to connect um, better with, um, with visitors and newcomers. Um, and so we are planning two um, newcomer sessions next weekend that we hope that people will find some time to attend. These are going to be pretty informal. Other years I've taught a formal new UU class, but this year I'm just feeling as though what's important is for people to get together, get to know each other a little bit, and hear a little bit about the, about the church and its history. So that will be um, next Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, here in the historical room, which is this room off here. Um, and then after church on Sunday at 11.30. And you could come to both, you could come to one, but I hope you will try to come. And as uh, we will also be planning a, um, a new member service on May 1st as well for people who feel as though they might be ready to, to join the book, uh, join the church and sign the book uh, officially. So with that, um, let us deepen our hearts and our spirits for worship. Everything begins on the verge of awareness. The dawn is not, and then is. Sleep is, and then is not. In between is the awakening. The passage of thin light between breaks open the day. The passage of thin sound between flows into the day. Too soon, the numbing rumble of traffic swells and the day glares. Let the soft haze hand again across the row of morning. Wait upon that narrow moment, the first awareness of being in between. Live days and seasons on the thin edge of dawn in praise of every single thing beginning now. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn this morning is number 298 in the gray hymnal, Wake Now My Senses. You're welcome to rise in body or in spirit, and we will be singing the first, third, and fifth verses. Oh. 
the Unitarian Universalist faith tradition, we enter into worship with the kindling of our chalice. May its light guide our way forward in our lifelong search for meaning and connection and justice. We'll get there. Oh, hi. Careful. We take a moment now to affirm the covenant that we share with one another. The words are printed in your order of service, and you're welcome to join in with us. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. Life is a gift for which we are grateful. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and the mysteries of this great gift. And now, as we have been doing in recent weeks, we're going to take a moment to remember all the people of the world who are living through conditions of war and violence. And today, as we have been for 39 days now, we especially hold the Ukrainian people closely in our hearts as they continue to resist the Russian invasion. So this morning and on Sundays to come until peace is restored, we will light a candle for Ukraine and for all the parts of the world that are faced with war. I have a wisdom story for us this morning that comes from the Jewish tradition. And it's a story of a wealthy king who had everything that he wanted. And he had the very best of everything. He had perfect tapestries, and he had piles of gold, and sculptures made by the best sculptors in the land, paintings, everything. But his favorite possession of all was a diamond. He had the most perfect, most beautiful diamond anyone could ever imagine. It was huge. It was the size of his hand. And it was absolutely flawless, perfectly clear, sparkling, gorgeous. And he used to just love to go in and sit and admire his diamond. And one day, he went to do that. And he took it out, and it was scratched. No one knows what happened to it, but there was suddenly a deep scratch in the diamond, a flaw. And he was devastated. So he reached out and he sent messages to all of the stone cutters and the diamond cutters in all across the land and asked them to come and to see if they could repair his diamond. And one by one, they all came and they, they studied it and they thought about it. And then they said, no, it's too deep. We can't polish this um, flaw out of the diamond. We'll, we're afraid it will break. And it was very disappointing. But then one last diamond cutter arrived. And he also took it and studied it and studied it. And suddenly broke out into a big smile. And he said, your majesty, I know how to fix your diamond. So they arranged that the diamond cutter would take it for two weeks and work on it, but that the king could not come near to see what he was doing. And that drove the king kind of crazy because he was just waiting for two weeks, not able to do anything, and he was so eager and anxious. And so the two weeks passed, the diamond cutter returned. He had been working on it every day for two weeks. He would get out his tools, and he would figure out like what he was wanted to do to, to repair this, um, and he was as careful as he could be because he was so afraid of breaking it. So the day came. 
He returned with it all carefully wrapped up, and he took the coverings off, and there it was. And the king took it. And instead of trying to polish out the flaw, the diamond cutter had etched a beautiful, exquisite flower around the flaw to hide it. And now the diamond was even more beautiful than ever, even though it was flawed. And the king was thrilled. And ever after that, every time the king went to sit and admire his diamond, he could admire the great beauty of it and see that sometimes something even more beautiful can emerge from something that's ugly and damaged. Thank you for listening. Our responsive reading this morning is by Howard Thurman, and it's, you can see it in the order of service, in the insert. And please read along with me the italicized portions. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. At the time, it was full orbed, glorious, and resplendent. I was sure that I would never forget. There was no intent to betray what seemed so sure at the time. My response was whole, clean, authentic. If there had been some direct challenge, a clear-cut issue, I would have fought it to the end and beyond. So that in fair weather or foul, in good times or in tempests, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless, or familiar, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. I invite us now into a time of prayer to be followed by silent meditation. Source of life and love, all that is eternal. We ask that you hold us in your loving embrace today. We pause in gratitude to remember all that we have been given. And just the ordinary promise and possibility of an early spring morning. We ask to be reminded today of all those people displaced by war, those killed and wounded, those left without family and loved ones. Be with them, and may they feel the love of the world surrounding them as they try every day to make sense of their lives. Today, we also pray for all of our transgender friends and family. This past week marked the annual Transgender Day of Visibility but 
we pray here today that every day, each and every one might feel seen and heard, safe and loved and welcomed into the fullness of their lives wherever they live, wherever they worship. We pray for courage, for understanding, and for the sustaining embrace of love. Spirit of life, our thoughts now turn towards ourselves and our loved ones. And so we will pause now and we invite names or joys or sorrows to be spoken aloud into the silence or even just to be held silently in the care of this community. So now, please, if you wish, speak a joy or a sorrow or a concern. Blessed Spirit, we ask your loving care upon all those whose names were spoken aloud or the ones held silently in our hearts. All this we ask in your name, which is love, as we enter into silence. Amen.
The reading this morning is called What to Remember When Waking, and it's by David White. In that first hardly noticed moment in which you wake, coming back to this life from the other more secret, movable, and frighteningly honest world where everything began, there is a small opening into the new day which closes the moment you begin your plans. What you can plan is too small. F- what you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can live wholeheartedly will make plans enough for the vitality hidden in your sleep. To be human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. To remember the other world in this world is to live in your true inheritance. You are not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amid other accidents. You were invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. Now, looking through the slanting light of the morning window toward the mountain presence of everything that can be, what urgency calls you to your one love? What shape waits in the seed of you to grow and spread its branches against a future sky? Is it waiting in the fertile sea, in the trees beyond the house? in the life you can imagine for yourself, in the open and lovely white page on the writing desk. Now more than ever, It matters that we are here. More than ever, our churches have an important role in our lives as we struggle to regain our normal lives. More than ever, this community of faith, this place of memory and hope, provides the roots and the wings for us to speak and to act on behalf of all of those whose voices are not heard. We are here today because of the love and the faith of all those who have gone before us. We carry on the work that they began, and we will shepherd the story forward for those who come after us. For the life and the health of this congregation and its ministries in the wider world, this morning's offering will now be gratefully received. Blessings upon the givers and upon your gifts.
just so no one's concerned. I know the order of service says there will be additional readings, but um, that shouldn't have been there. You know, it struck me when I reread David White's poem that Murren read for us just now. What struck me is how often the poets urge us to make sure that we are trying to live life to its fullest. You are not a troubled guest in this world, David White said to us. What urgency calls you to your one true love? Mary Oliver famously put this question to us. Tell me, she wrote, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And a newer poet, Donna Markova, states, I will not die an unlived life. Here we are now in the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are finally stepping back into our normal lives or what we remember them to be. And even as we take off our masks and begin to say yes to dinners and concerts and movies, we are aware that there is a dark cloud on the horizon, the specter of yet another COVID variant that is beginning to take hold here in the United States. We feel unsure. Do we dare fully emerge into the wildness of our lives? And when? So for just over two years now, we have been largely on hold, waiting, suspended, and not fully living our lives. I have this image of us as trapeze artists, sitting carefully on our swings, high above the nets, gently rocking to and fro, but unable to use all of our skills, unable to take our chances to let go and to fly through the air. We've been sitting and waiting. Our story this morning resonated with me as I thought about these past two years. Our lives have been something like the king's diamond. We hold our lives very dear. We have hopes and dreams and aspirations. And then one day our lives suddenly developed a deep scratch, a crack, much like the king's diamond did. And suddenly our lives were not what we had cherished. Very little of what we had always taken for granted was available to us. And we have lived with this flaw, this crack, for two years. Now we've talked a lot about the pandemic and its impact. It's been part of our everyday realities and part of the life of this church and of every institution worldwide. And so it's tempting to put it behind us and to say, let's just look forward. Let's stop dwelling on the hard times. It's time for some fun. And all of that is completely true, especially it is time for some fun. But as with so many of life's hard times, if we don't take a close look, if we don't surface our feelings and allow ourselves to feel our losses, then we never will really be able to return to wholeness and fully live our lives. The feelings don't go away. They just remain hidden from view. And as I so often say to people, if you just keep sweeping everything under the rug, all that happens is that it gets really lumpy under the rug. It's been a hard time, a sad time, a frightening time. And it's okay to feel that and to speak it out loud. We've been isolated and sometimes lonely and often depressed. Those are the scratches in the diamond that we need to be able to touch, to run our fingers over, and to explore the shape of the flaws and the hurts 
And I hope that everybody is taking time to do some of that work and to not feel as though we should just jump straight to a party. And you might not yet be feeling like celebrating. And let me say here that if depression really has taken a hold of you, and if you are feeling despair, I hope that you can reach out and name that and ask for help. There is a great deal to feel sad and depressed about. And we all know that. Right now we are in the Christian season of Lent, the 40 days that precede Easter. It is intended to be a time of preparation. Lent is intended to mirror the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness preparing himself to undertake the public ministry that ultimately led to his death. And so this can be a very valuable time, a time when we intentionally think more deeply about our lives and how we want to live them. It's a time for prayer or contemplation or meditation, time to listen to your own deepest feelings in whatever way serves you the best. I've been engaging in some of this work throughout this season. It's been a time of taking stock, checking in with myself to see how I have weathered these past two years. And with my sabbatical in the near future, I've been using this time to plan, to listen and discern what I most need from these three months that you are so generously granting me. To paraphrase our poet, I will not waste an unlived sabbatical. And in this time of discernment, I have come to understand that what I most need is a more intentional spiritual life. That sense of urgency is guiding my planning and my choices. I've been setting up some programs and some practitioners to help guide me. And I've come to understand that I can't achieve these desires alone, that I need some help to achieve this along the way. And that has helped me to feel excited and energized and ready. I've been remembering, as Howard Thurman wrote, that to which my life is committed. And I am refreshing my highest resolve. This is a time for everyone to revisit their highest resolves, to freshen them. Our theme this month is awakening. Now, so often when we consider the spiritual practice of awakening, we associate it with finding different paths toward enlightenment. And then too, there's another way to awaken, and we see that in, the, in our daily lives as we try to awaken to the voices and the experiences of our siblings of color, to do the work that we need to do in order to become more woke. But the awakening I'm thinking about this morning is an active awakening, actively revisiting and assessing our daily lives to see what we need right now to restore our energy, our zest for life, and to set out on our journeys again with hope and excitement. As spring returns and the earth awakes, what feels urgent to you? Do you sense what you are missing and what you need to restore your heart and your spirit? The answer will be different for everyone. There is no right answer. It's a little daunting, perhaps, to think about leaping back into action. We all have different risk tolerances, different health concerns, so there is no one answer for how to restore your lives and to awaken. Everyone must make their own decisions. We are sitting on those trapeze swings, some of us still sitting still, some beginning to pump hard and start making those wild and breathtaking arcs of motion through the air. Some have already begun to let go of their swings in midair. 
some travel, concerts, dinners out. I mentioned my own sense of urgency around deepening my spiritual life. But I personally also feel an awakening of urgency in another direction too. And that is that these days I am so aware of our energy collectively when we do manage to be together and how much I need that, how much that feeds me. I am not complaining about what we have managed to do during the pandemic. We have been so blessed to be able to use Zoom and YouTube to continue to offer our services. And I don't want to even think about what would have happened to our church, all churches really, in these past two years, had we not been able to experiment with being together while being alone. It worked. But I think over time that we began to forget what it was like together in a room as we adjusted and accepted that new normal. As Howard Thurman put it, there crept into my life the dust and grit of the journey. Lately, I've been joyfully reminded of what happens when we are together. Some of our committees here at church have returned to in-person meetings, and the difference is palpable. There's energy present that we each bring into the room when we gather. I was so aware of this yesterday when the worship associates met for an in-person meeting for the first time in a really long time. The way that the conversation flows is so different when we are seated together with all the give and take and the brainstorming and the laughter. It's life-giving to be together. The meeting gave me energy and it offered me new ideas for improving our church services, and it helped me to awaken. Now, many of us are introverts, and I've talked to a lot of people who feel that they navigated the pandemic well, and that they didn't mind spending a lot of time alone, didn't miss being with other people frequently, and there is certainly truth to that. And of course, for too many of us, it still does not feel safe to gather indoors, and you are still waiting, and there is truth there too, and I see you. But there is a larger truth for all of us, and that is that humans are meant to live in communities, meant to connect and to share our lives, and to offer our energy to one another. Community life sustains us, helps to keep us whole and centered. It awakens us. We had an amazing example of that here in our service a couple of weeks ago when I invited you all to share your thoughts about your lives during the pandemic. And the insights and the trust and the openness created something for us. It wove our community back together and it lifted our spirits. There was joy. There is no life apart from life together, wrote the Reverend Rebecca Parker. We are relational beings and we depend on one another, not just for companionship, but for insight into understanding ourselves as well. Think about how we identify ourselves so often based on our relationships. We think of ourselves as friends, as parents, as lovers. Those roles, those identities cannot exist without those relationships. So our relationships and our life in community feel urgent to me these days. Of all the th many things that we have to restore in the coming months and even years, strengthening our communities should be a priority. Sure, we managed over the past two years. We stayed afloat, we stayed organized, and we took care of our affairs. Our energy went toward problem solving and innovating, and we demonstrated over and over again that we are remarkably good at that. Thank you all so much. I could not do this by myself. 
But that energy came from someplace. And the source of it is in the togetherness, in those casual conversations and the connections that we can make over coffee or in a potluck out on the lawn. And that provides us our motivation for carrying on, both within this institution and outside of it. We need one another, often in ways that we cannot easily name. We cannot restore our wholeness without our togetherness. This, for me, is where urgency lies right now. My friends, for too long years, we have existed as troubled guests in our own lives. We have shared a challenging experience, one that will be with us for the rest of our lives. We have shared it, and yet at the same time, we have often gone through it completely alone. The losses have mounted, and we have swallowed our fear, our sadness, and our isolation. But life is calling to us again to awaken, to emerge, to join the earth as it returns to life all around us. How will you answer this call? When you study the scratches in the diamond of your life, what can you imagine emerging from them? Can you recall the moments of your highest resolve? I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. Spirit of life, be with us as we struggle to know the best way forward, to stay safe from illness, and yet find ways to once again be people deeply connected to community. Help us to imagine again, to dream and to hope and to find our way forward. Blessed be. Amen. I invite us now to say together the unison prayer that is printed in your order of service, the New Zealand Book of Common Prayer. Eternal Spirit, Closing hymn is number 21 in your gray hymnal, For the Beauty of the Earth.
closing, I leave you with the words of Howard Thurman. In the quietness of this place, surrounded by the all-pervading presence of God, my heart whispers, keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. So that in fair weather or in foul, in good times or in tempests, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless or familiar, I may not forget that to which my life is committed. Keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve. And now, as we extinguish our chalice, I invite all of you at home to extinguish, to hold up your candle, and together we will blow them out as we say the words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our service has ended, our service has begun. Go in peace and return in love. Amen.